Before we get into this case, I want to say a huge thank you to Nutrafol for partnering with me on today's video. Did you know that hair thinning will happen to approximately one in two women? If you have experienced hair thinning, just know you are not alone. Thinning is normal, but trying to figure out what to do about it can be frustrating. That's why I partnered with Nutrafol. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement with over 1 million people seeking thicker, stronger, faster growing hair with less shedding. Now, each person's root cause of hair thinning can be so different, so a one-size-fits-all approach to hair growth is never going to work. Nutrafol offers physician formulas with drug-free ingredients to support healthy hair growth by targeting the root cause of thinning. This includes stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, and metabolism, which are all going to change throughout a woman's life. Whether you are postpartum, going through menopause, or changed your lifestyle recently, there is a formula that better suits your specific needs. All you do is take a hair wellness quiz at Nutrafol.com and you will get a personalized hair health plan based on your root causes. Nutrafol clinically tests all of their final formulations to ensure efficacy and in one study, it was reported that 86% of women reported improved hair growth after taking Nutrafol's women's hair growth supplements for six months. I personally shed so much. I feel so bad for my roommates because my hair is literally everywhere around the house. When I'm vacuuming, it's my hair that gets stuck in the vacuum, not the dogs. Because of this constant shedding, I personally take Nutrafol Women's Vegan, which is perfect for me because I do eat a plant-based diet. I love having long hair and I want to make sure that I can keep growing it out without all the shedding. And since starting Nutrafol, I've definitely noticed a lot less shedding and my hair feels stronger and healthier than ever. Find out why over 4,500 healthcare professionals and hairstylists recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering my viewers $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping when you head to Nutrafol.com and enter code RS10. Once again, head to Nutrafol.com spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com and enter code RS10 to get $10 off your first month's subscription. Thank you again so much to Nutrafol for partnering with me on today's video. We all know when it comes to horrific things like sexual assault and rape, we need to believe all women. For far too long, women have been ridiculed and called liars when they come out with genuine accusations against the men who have hurt them. But in some rare cases, we hear stories like this one where one woman decides to come up with lie after lie, falsely accusing so many different people of so many horrific, violent things. And when things like this happens, it harms not just the people involved, but every single woman who has suffered abuse in her life. This is the disgusting story of Eleanor Williams. Eleanor Williams, who went by Ellie, was born to parents Allison Johnston and Peter Williams, and she grew up in Walney Island in Barrow and Furness, England, with her mother and her stepfather. Eleanor has an older sister named Lucy and a brother who has not been named publicly as far as I've seen. Eleanor's mother, Allison, was known locally as a pillar in the community. She worked as a labor counselor for the community and was well-respected by those around her. She was known to be very community-oriented who put her all into representing the people of the town. By all accounts, Ellie grew up in a normal middle-class home in a nice neighborhood with a family who loved her. But according to what Ellie would later tell police, throughout her life, she went through some of the most horrific things a person can go through. Ellie's story starts back in November of 2017 when Ellie was only 16 years old. Now, one night that November, Ellie reported that she was attending a little get-together with some friends at the home of Cameron Bibby. She said that she had been smoking weed and drinking alcohol that night, but she started to feel sick. At that point, Cameron and his friends contacted Ellie's mother and older sister who came to pick her up. They took her to the hospital to get checked out, but... Once at the hospital, Ellie confided in her mother and sister that she had been raped by Cameron that night. Of course, this immediately concerned her family and hospital staff, so they called the authorities to report this. She then went into the police station to make her statement. 
In that statement, she said that Cameron had forcibly kissed her. He then followed her into the bathroom and watched her urinate, making comments about her pubic area. She said he then started touching her inappropriately before sitting on her and taking her clothes off without her consent. Ellie continued that she told Cameron to stop, but he threatened to set his dog on her to attack her and that he would bury her in the garden or put her in the sea if she didn't comply. Obviously, hearing what this poor 16-year-old went through was horrific. So, by November 27, 2017, Cameron was arrested and interviewed. He denied all of these accusations, but regardless, he was charged with sexual assault. He was released after this pending investigation, but by January of 2018, Ellie actually withdrew her support for prosecution, basically meaning that she was dropping the charges. But the tragic series of events of Ellie being the victim of abuse did not stop there. By March 8, 2019, 18-year-old Ellie went out for the night with a man named Jordan Trengrove and a few other friends. That night of the 8th turned into the early morning hours of March 9th. Throughout the night, Ellie had been drinking, becoming so intoxicated that those around her felt the need to take her home. But in the days after that night, Ellie confided in a few friends claiming that she was taken by Jordan to some place she didn't recognize. There, she said that Jordan raped her before taking her back home. The following day, she received some very derogatory and vile messages from Jordan, which she screenshotted to make sure that she would have them saved if she needed them. At that time, she didn't want to report what happened to the police. Which happens in a lot of these sexual abuse cases. Men or women won't go to the police because they're embarrassed and blame themselves. Or they fear retaliation, so they just keep it to themselves and hope that nothing happens after that. However, two months later, by May 6th, 2019, Jordan had apparently come over to Ellie's apartment. She let him in, but once he was there, he would not leave. She tried forcing him to leave her place, but that just caused a fight to happen between the two. At that point, Jordan pulled out a pocket knife and began threatening her with it. After that, he stripped her naked in the living room before forcibly pulling her into the bathroom by yanking her hair. He then ripped the shower head off the wall and started beating her with it. During the altercation, the two ended up on the floor, so Jordan started to rape her and during the rape, he threatened to kill Ellie. Once the whole ordeal was over, he finally left, but Ellie was left with injuries. She had bruises all over her legs, and of course, she was traumatized. Finally, after the second rape, Ellie reluctantly decided to call the police to report what he had done. She went to the police with those screenshots in hand, which showed that Jordan had messaged her saying some derogatory things, basically proving what he did to her on March 9th. She also showed them the bruises that she sustained from the horrific May 6th attack. Of course, after this report, Jordan was arrested and questioned about both incidents. Once again, Jordan denied all accusations, but he did end up being arrested and charged with the sexual assaults. But shortly after being arrested, he was released on bail. But it seems that him being released on bail only made things worse for Ellie. By May 18th, 2019, Ellie called the police once again to report that Jordan returned to her apartment and violently raped her once again. She explained that after a night out, she arrived home when Jordan entered the apartment through an unlocked door. At the time, she was expecting a friend to come over, so that is why the door was unlocked. She tried pushing him out of the apartment, but once again, he hit her and a fight broke out. He proceeded to hit her on her face and body. Once she had fallen to the floor, he got on top of her and raped her again before fleeing. After this took place, Ellie mustered the courage to call 911 again to report what happened right away. By the time police responded, they found Ellie unconscious and naked on the floor of her apartment. She was clearly injured at that time. Once again, police arrested Jordan, and this time, he was not released on bail. He spent the following 73 days in jail as a sex offender. During that time, as Jordan was awaiting his time in jail, by June 18, 2019, 
Ellie spoke with detectives about another horrific situation she went through. At this point, Ellie had been through so much and had to tell detectives all of these horrible stories. She was seeing the men who attacked her being held responsible for their actions. So, she finally felt comfortable enough to disclose further information to a detective with whom she had been working. Ellie told this detective that she was the victim of sex trafficking since the age of 12 or 13 years old, and she knew who was responsible. She named then 40-year-old Mohammed Ramsan, married father of four and local businessman, as being the leader in this sex trafficking ring. Ellie said that when she was 12, Muhammad befriended her, and shortly after, he groomed her into having sex with him. After that, this started happening on a regular basis. Then, Ellie said that he convinced her to sleep with yet another man. This turned into her being taken from place to place all across the area to have sex with tons of random men, all against her Will. She described that she wasn't the only girl being abused, she was one of many. And even though this whole thing started with Mohammed, other men started to join in. And soon, it was a whole group of men who were abusing and trafficking the girls. All of the sexual acts she was forced to perform were being recorded and sold for money. And that wasn't all. After this all started, the girls were being treated worse and worse. If the girls didn't do what they were told, they were beaten. There was one girl who was beaten so badly that she almost died as a result, and another girl was thrown down the stairs and beaten. Another girl had a dog set on her. The girls were also forced to watch videos of other girls being violently raped. This went on for years. Ellie went on to describe that Muhammad took her on a trip to Amsterdam, and there, Muhammad forced her to work at a brothel. On the same trip, Muhammad tried to sell her for $25,000, but I guess the buyer didn't go through with that deal for whatever reason. This isn't really explained more, but he didn't go through with it. He also attempted to take her to Pakistan, but that also didn't work out. Then, after the Amsterdam trip, he forced her to live in a camper van for two weeks, which was driven all around the UK. During that time, she was forcibly injected with heroin to make her more easily subdued so that more men could have sex with her for money. She was forced to attend party after party after party, constant parties where she and other young women had to dress in certain clothing and provide sexual favors for any man who wanted it. Then, one of the girls she was trafficked with got pregnant, and she was forced to take this girl to get an illegal abortion. After that, she was taken to Ibiza for two weeks, where once again, different men would pay Muhammad to have sex with her. To support her claims, Ellie showed the officer messages on Snapchat that she had screenshotted. The messages were sexual in nature, and according to the screenshots, they had been sent back and forth between Ellie and multiple men that she had listed as being involved in this sex trafficking ring. Of course, after hearing all of these details, the detective on her case was deeply troubled. She felt that Ellie was the victim of serious sexual exploitation, only now being brave enough to tell her story. She was so descriptive in everything she said. She gave detailed accounts of some of the horrendous abuse that she and some of the other victims went through, some of which I did leave out because they were that horrific and graphic. This detective was concerned that there was this highly dangerous and violent group of sex traffickers operating in the borough in Furnace area. After this account by Ellie, detectives got together and began a multi-agency investigation into this ring. The detective also offered for Ellie to stay in a safe house or go into witness protection. At the time, Ellie declined participation in witness protection, which does make sense because you kind of have to have a completely new life, a new identity, and everything. Not everyone's going to want to do that, but she did agree to stay in a hotel provided by the police near the police station, somewhere that would be guarded and where she would be safe. They even lined up a job for her at the hotel so she could make money and live her life, never having to leave the hotel while police investigated her claims. 
After starting her stay at the hotel, there were a few times where Ellie would leave the hotel and would cause her family and officers to panic and worry about where she was and what could have happened to her. On June 30th, 2019, she left the hotel and went to Blackpool via the train. There, she checked herself into a hotel room. She went to various places in Blackpool, not answering messages being sent from the police or her family. Everyone was worried about her. Finally, after several hours, officers were able to track her down and met up with her to find out what happened. That is when she told officers that her traffickers found her at that hotel and ordered her to go to Blackpool, so she did. She said that she met with Mohammed, who threatened to murder her if she didn't comply. So, she did, and she went to four different hotels with him, riding with him in a car to each place where she was brutally raped by multiple different men. Then, as we know, police officers tracked her down and were able to take her back to the hotel safely. A little over two weeks after that, on July 18th, Ellie left the hotel again, this time catching a train to Leeds, spending some time there before heading back to Barrow and Furnace. Once again, Everybody was worried about her while she was out, and as she was out, her brother actually happened to see her walking in the area, so he picked her up and took her home, calling the police to let them know what happened. When police spoke with her about this incident, this time she said that on July 17th, a man named Salsa, one of the traffickers, came to her door, slapped her in the face, and pinned her against the wall by her neck. He told her that she caused him to lose money, so she needed to go out and earn them 10,000 pounds. They told her to go to Leeds, which she did. There, she was taken to a house where she had sex with two men. At that home, there were other girls who were also there being trafficked. After that, she was taken to a few more houses where she had sex with a total of six more men against her will. But at one of the homes, she saw a passport sitting on the table along with a plane ticket with flight details to Bangladesh, so she ran. She didn't want to give these men the chance to get her out of the country and away from safety. After running, the traffickers contacted her again and told her to go to Preston, which she did. There, she met with another trafficker who then forced her to do cocaine. Then, this man met up with two Asian men at the park where they both gave him money to rape her. One of the men took her to a back alley and raped her there. After the rape, she was allowed to go back to Barrow and Furnace. There, she was picked up by Salsa, who slapped her in the face and raped her again, telling her that she needed to sort herself out. Then, after that, she went home where she was met with police. When police saw her, she was clearly injured again and was barely conscious. She was then taken to the hospital for treatment. After this, it was decided that it was best if Ellie had just returned home to Walney Island where she would be with family. But the abuse and rape did not stop. By May 18th, 2020, Ellie left her home and did not return back for her curfew. So, Ellie's mother reported her as missing. It turned out that Ellie intended to catch a bus to borrow, but one of her traffickers ordered her a lift, which I guess she accepted for whatever reason. Then she was taken to a house in Barrow and Furnace. There were 10 men within that home, most of whom raped her. One of them also beat her and tried to cut her finger off. She was also beaten in the face with a hammer. She suffered the most horrific abuse and injuries imaginable at that home. After that, one of the men drove back to Walney Island. Then she walked off into a field where police later found her after suffering from countless injuries. She was unconscious at the time that she was found and she had bruises all over her face, legs, and abdomen. One eye was swollen shut and part of her pinky finger had been partially severed. By May 20th, Ellie took to Facebook to expose all of the injuries that she had suffered at the hands of her abusers. She took photos of her face and what she had gone through was clearly horrendous. In that post, she started by saying that this was the hardest thing she had ever had to write. She wrote that she was put into the back of a car and taken to an address where she was forced to have sex with three Asian men. She was then beaten because she was in debt to these men for not attending sex parties for several weeks due to COVID. She said that these men tried to cut her finger off to teach her a lesson. Then, 
they dumped her naked body in the middle of nowhere with broken ribs, bruises, and countless other injuries. In the post, she went on to write about how she had been sex trafficked for a number of years. She was trafficked all around different areas of London by a ring of sex traffickers, mostly made up of Asian and Pakistani men. She wrote that some local business owners were also involved. She then told parents to stay vigilant and keep on the lookout for their children's safety. She doesn't want what happened to her to happen to anybody else. Of course, this post shocked the internet. Her injuries were gruesome. She had clearly been through something horrendous. This post ended up being viewed over 100,000 times. This resulted in people creating a Facebook group called Justice for Ellie. They made t-shirts and posters and took to the streets to protest in Ellie's name. People were pissed that such a young, innocent girl went through something so horrific and it seemed that nobody cared. Police weren't doing anything. People in their own community were abusing and torturing young girls, living amongst them and their children. People were scared for their own safety. Due to the claims that a Pakistani business owner is involved, multiple Indian restaurants in the area had bricks thrown through their windows. One business owner said that he lost 90% of his customers after people claimed that his business was involved. Other business owners were receiving death threats, especially Mohammed Ramzan, who had been exposed as taking part in this sex trafficking ring. His children were harassed and his family was torn apart. Now, at this point, you might be wondering why and how it seems that all of these accusations and stories from Ellie were just allowed to continue happening. This all happened over the course of years and even when Ellie was reporting everything, it seemed that she just kept being abused and it seemed that nobody was really doing anything about it. However, it turned out that as police were investigating all of of the different claims that Ellie was making, they started to uncover a picture almost as disturbing, arguably more disturbing than the allegations she was claiming happened to her. Police realized that pretty much everything that Ellie was telling them were straight up lies. None of the stories were true, which is just crazy that someone can injure themselves in the way that Ellie apparently did. It didn't seem reasonable in the slightest, so that is why police truly didn't know what to think at first. Because when you have someone with this many horrendous and violent stories, and you've seen the injuries, you've seen how bad she looked, you've seen how miserable she is, you don't want to think that someone could be capable of making all of that up, especially with how detailed she was. You just don't want to think that someone is capable of coming up with all of that themselves. So I'm sure that's why it took so long for police to realize all of this, but when they did, it was like the floodgates just opened. So let's get into the investigation that happened into all of the claims that Ellie made and how police came to the conclusion that it was all just just a web of elaborate lies. So going back all the way to the first accusation from 2017, which involved Cameron Bibby, there wasn't a ton of evidence to support or deny the claims in this case, but her petition was withdrawn, so charges were never filed. But with the second, third, and fourth rapes from the March 9th and then the May 6th and May 18th, 2019, police found evidence that proved that Jordan Trengove was never even at her apartment during any of the times that she claimed she was raped. She also gave herself those bruises to support her story. Now, like I said, she did show officers messages sent between them that did prove her account of the story, but when police looked further into it, they found out that she actually sent those messages to herself. She had used different accounts to send herself messages to which she would reply and then reply back to herself using the other account. The problem was, however, was that all of the messages sent back and forth were using the IP address of her home's Wi-Fi network. So there was no way that she was texting back and forth with Jordan in her own home. That made absolutely no sense. They also found evidence that Jordan could not have been at Allie's home when she claimed. I'm not exactly sure what the evidence was, but they were able to confirm that he was elsewhere during those times. So police were confident that Jordan never raped Ellie 
She made up the entire thing. Now onto the biggest lie of all. When Allie told the trafficking story, she provided lists of every girl who had been trafficked, as well as other men who were involved in the trafficking. She had detailed descriptions of each and every person involved. Names, physical descriptions, what each person was like, and what their role was. Again, she described incredibly graphic accounts of what happened when each of these women were brutally raped and abused. But, when detectives questioned the women that Ellie had listed, every single one of them denied having ever been trafficked. There were actually some women that were really upset at the fact that someone else was using their name and making up such horrific things about them. They also looked into other parts of her story, such as her being trafficked in Amsterdam. It turned out that she did, in fact, visit Amsterdam, but it was with her sister and her sister's partner for a vacation. They all stayed in a hotel room together, basically being together the entire time. There was never a time that Allie was away from her sister for long enough to have been trafficked. When confronted with this evidence, Ellie would later claim that Muhammad trafficked her while she was on the trip with Lucy, but Lucy told detectives that this just wasn't possible due to how much time they had spent together on this trip. As if that wasn't enough, CCTV footage did also confirm that during the time that Ellie was in Amsterdam, Muhammad was seen in his local area in England far away from Amsterdam. After hearing the initial stories that Ellie had told, Muhammad Ramzan was arrested and questioned. But after extensive investigation, police found that Muhammad had never even met Ellie, never been alone in a room with her, let alone had sex with her. He was not in Blackpool or Leeds or anywhere else she said he was when she was forced to leave the hotel police provided. It turned out that Ellie would start messaging different people on Snapchat and it got to the point where they would exchange sexual messages but she would change these people's name on Snapchat to match the names of people she named as being involved in the sex trafficking ring. So that way, when she screenshotted these sexually explicit messages, it would appear that they were sent from somebody else. Some of the people she came up with were real names. One name she gave was of someone she vaguely knew in high school who was into her back when they were in high school, but they never actually dated. Another man was someone she had made friends with, but they weren't all that close and never really talked, so I guess they were more like acquaintances in the past, not currently, but I guess they had talked occasionally. Then some of the names she gave were completely made up. She even went as far as getting two different phones so she could send messages back and forth to make it look like traffickers or some of the other trafficked women were texting her. In one of those messages, she made it look like someone named Nicole, another trafficking victim, had texted her, angry at Ellie for leaving her alone in Leeds after she apparently escaped. So, that whole Leeds situation where she got out because she saw the plane ticket, apparently this Nicole girl was mad at her because she left her alone in that house, but that situation never happened. Once, she even wrote herself a fake letter and signed it as being from someone else and then mailed it to herself. That is just insane behavior. After she started staying at that hotel that police provided, each time she went out and said that she was forced to go by traffickers, obviously that was a lie. With the Blackpool incident, she was taken by police around the town to tell them where the men had taken her. But she wasn't able to point out anywhere even close to where she had been taken when she claimed she was raped. That was the first red flag. But officers were able to find CCTV footage that showed exactly what she did that day. She took the train to Blackpool by herself. Then she was seen on video walking alone on foot. Then she went to a shop, bought some food, and returned back to her hotel where she watched YouTube videos. The next day, she woke up and continued on with her day. When she was confronted with this evidence, she told officers that her traffickers forced her to make up the story she told. Yes, her traffickers would force a victim to make up a story about abusing their victim so police would look even harder for them and feel even worse for the victim. It makes perfect sense. 
I guess. The story from July 18th was also completely discredited by CCTV. Footage showed her walking around Leeds by herself. She then met up with a man who she hung out with, and according to text messages, she met up with him and they had consensual sex. After that, they planned to meet back up for another date. She then left and went back to borrow in Furnace and returned home. According to the CCTV footage from her walking home after taking the train, she was unharmed with no visible injuries. She was walking just fine, no apparent signs of intoxication at the time. However, 20 minutes later, when police were called to her home, she appeared drugged up with visible bruises and abrasions all over her face and body. Right, so they, they just around now and we're, and we're recording. So these two Exclusive police footage shows William's deception began three years earlier when she said she'd been raped at a party. She withdrew her involvement, but a year and a half later, she makes a fresh allegation. So this chap pushing out the door couldn't. He has a knife, he was waving it around. Notice her bruised cheek. Just weeks after this, she claims she's being trafficked and raped by a gang of Asian men. Whichever man was willing to pay the most money you go with, they'll they tell us they can treat us how we want because they're white trash. It was, we need to do something to tell this girl. What is going on? She describes the properties she was forced to go to in great detail. It wasn't like a house, it was more like a bowl of shop, orangey cool ones. The police treated Williams like a victim, but suspicions began to arise after they spent two days driving her around a town she said she'd been recently trafficked to and was unable to provide any leads. Was it on that route that you took us on or was it somewhere else? I don't know. Not sure. And what it ended up being was me driving around fairly aimlessly just in the hope that something might look familiar to Ellie. That's when I first started wondering myself personally, is there any truth in this? The following week, her lies unravel further when police are called to her home. You all right? Injured and seemingly intoxicated, Hi. she makes more claims of being trafficked. An investigation takes place and this is the innocent young man she accuses. CCTV from that night shows the pair met by chance in Preston when he asks her for a lighter. It's Williams who pursues a conversation. She's then seen on camera in Barrow and Furnace walking home with no visible injuries. But when police arrive at her flat 20 minutes later, this is what they find. Come, I'll help you. I'll help you. She'll get you an ambulance. It was after this last lie in July of 2019 that police finally realized that none of what Ellie had been telling them was true. It was after that story of her being forced to go to Leeds that police really started to get suspicious. Again, they took her around Leeds in the car, trying to figure out where exactly she was taken by the man she called Salsa, but for some reason, she wasn't able to give any information or point out anywhere she had been. That is really what prompted them to take a look at the CCTV footage and put the pieces together. By May of 2020, she had been arrested and charged with making false statements to police. But after being released on bail, that is when she went home to her family, and then that is when she claimed to have been taken to a house and raped by three Asian men before being found naked and injured in a field. She then went and made this Facebook post. Little did anybody online know, she was in the middle of being investigated for false allegations when she made that post. So all of those people were going out and protesting and making a big stir about this girl who was being investigated for lying about the exact claims that she was making online. Of course, the whole story of her being taken to that house and being raped by three Asian men and then her being found in the field, that story was also false. Which again, is hard to believe when you see the horrific injuries that she had. But after finding her in that field, police were also able to locate a hammer that was hidden against a fence near where she was found in the field. On that hammer, police found her DNA and traces of her blood with no other DNA found. Using the hammer, they were able to trace where it was purchased to a local Tesco and borrow and furnace. After visiting the store, investigators found that the same hammer had been purchased using a debit card just days before Ellie's attack on May 11th. 
That led them to checking CCTV footage from the store, and lo and behold, Ellie was seen buying that very hammer that was used in her attack at that store. I also do want to mention that in this attack, she claimed again that she was beaten with a hammer, but that they tried chopping her finger off to teach her a lesson, but it was found partially severed and it was her pinky finger. So if you ask me, this proves that it was an attack that she did on her own because a pinky finger is easy to chop off. Like, if you're angry enough and you're going to try to chop someone's finger off, you're going to do it all the way. You're not just going to stop halfway through and make sure they keep their finger. You're going to completely cut that sucker off and make sure that they suffer for the rest of their life with no finger. So, the fact that it wasn't completely cut off shows that Ellie didn't actually want permanent damage to her finger. She didn't want to lose a finger. She just wanted to make it look really convincing. Also, during that last hospital stay in May, of 2020 when she was apparently found in a field after suffering from those hammer injuries, she was examined by a forensic pathologist and they found that the only areas of her body that were injured were areas that she could reach herself. There was not a single bruise, scratch, or mark on any part of her body that she wouldn't be able to reach herself with a hammer. Everything was on the front of her face and body, so that led the pathologist to determine that it was very likely that her injuries were self-inflicted. In court, a judge ruled these injuries were self-inflicted and that she was play-acting. All of this footage, which has never been seen outside the legal system until today, tells the story of multiple desperate reports, the final one being where Williams was found wounded in a field. Tests would show her injuries were self-inflicted. So, of course, police arrested Ellie and charged her with eight counts of perverting the course of justice for all of these false stories that she was telling. That also prompted Jordan Trengove to be released from jail, where, again, he served 73 days due to the allegations made against him. As Ellie awaited her trial in jail, she actually wrote to her sister, Lucy, asking her if she could tell prosecutors that a hammer was found in her bedroom basically trying to get her sister to lie to officers and make her story look more believable. Due to this, Ellie was charged with an additional count of perverting the course of justice. However, when she was first arrested, supporters of Ellie's flew into a rage. Once again, more demonstrations, more vandalizing of Asian-owned properties, more death threats towards the men thought to be involved. People thought that Ellie's arrest was victim-blaming at its worst. But when her trial started in October of 2022, the truth would come out. The prosecution in her case called Ellie a serial liar and that each and every one of her accounts were fabrications and lies. They talked about how there was no evidence to support any of her claims and, in fact, there was evidence to the contrary. They talked about the fake messages she sent herself, the fake Snapchat names. For Jordan, they said that he had an alibi for each and every night that Ellie claimed he showed up in her home. Same thing with Mohammed Ramzan. He wasn't in Amsterdam when she claimed. Travel records confirmed that Ellie had never even been to Ibiza. They talked about how some of the traffickers and victims she named didn't even exist. She just made the names up. They talked about the CCTV footage that showed each and every time she was trafficked, where really she was just out and about by herself. However, during the trial, Ellie completely denied all accusations. She stood by her claims saying that she was abused, she was trafficked, everything she said was true. Anytime there was a lie that was confirmed as not being physically possible, she just said that she was forced to say it by an abuser. She adamantly denied hitting herself with a hammer, saying, I'm not a psychopath. But in the end, the evidence against Ellie was damning and showed a very clear picture of a young woman who lied and lied and lied over and over and over again. It was said that throughout the trial, she showed no remorse gave no explanation for her behavior. At the end of the trial, the jury was sent off for deliberations, and after just a few hours, they came back with their verdict. They found that Eleanor Williams is guilty on all eight counts of perverting justice. She did end up pleading guilty to that ninth count from her writing that letter to her sister. Um, in this case, the defendant was convicted after trial 
on counts one to eight, each of which allege perverting the course of justice. She's also to be sentenced on count nine, a further count of perverting the course of justice, to which she entered a guilty plea on the 15th of February 2022, and for which she'll receive full credit. When it was time for the courts to decide her sentencing, Ellie's defense argued that Ellie actually has complex post-traumatic stress disorder. They argued that she had a lot of difficulties in her childhood. She began self-harming when she was younger, but her doctor couldn't really provide much detail into what difficulties she actually faced. Like, they didn't give really any examples or any specific instances or anything to actually support their claims. The judge did say that given the significance of the story she came up with, there has to be some sort of mental impairment to be able to come up with this and lie like she did, to go to such great lengths to create these false accusations against men she didn't even really know. But really, there is no explanation for this. The judge also has to consider all of the hardships that her accusations caused on the victims in this case. Jordan's house was spray-painted with the word rapist. His mother was being harassed so badly that she had to move out of her home. Again, he spent 73 days in jail. He was harassed on the streets by strangers. He got death threats. He's also a father now, and CPS would randomly get anonymous calls saying that Jordan is not fit to be a father. When he moved, his neighbor called him a rapist and blatantly said that he wasn't welcome there. It got to the point where he fell into a deep depression. Jordan even tried to take his own life because of the significant impact these allegations had on his life. Thankfully, he is still alive, but he suffers every day and has to take antidepressants. Can you just briefly describe the impact? Well, I've tried ending my life over it. I've had a bond with my son. I've not been able to leave the house. I've not been able to go to work. No, I've got no answer to why. I'd still love to know why, but we'll never know, I guess. Does that make you worse if you have no idea why you've done this to you? Yeah, I've, I've always questioned that from the start, and I would love to know why this has happened and what's made her do this and why me? Out of everyone, why me? Then when it came to Muhammad Ramzan, his life was ruined. His children and wife were harassed. His business vandalized. He was sent death threats and told that he was not welcome in his community. Muhammad also attempted to take his own life. Thankfully, he too survived, but that wasn't the end of the impact on his family. His son, also tried to take his own life. His own children said that they don't want to be known as the kids of a pedo, a rapist. Everyone around town called them horrible people and made life for them unbearable. God, but Ellie made the claims. I got arrested in 2019, 7-7. Out of the blue? Out of the blue, totally out of the blue. But prior to that, for a year and a half, local, I've had issues, as in like social media going on, and it being, I'm a pedophile enabler. I orchestrated it and there was, well, that was just local and a lot of people knew and they were just always dismissed. Nobody really cared. You know, they were like the extreme, the, 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 the few people that are involved in this, they were the few, they were the extreme far right mm. and they were just pushing this agenda. After you were cleared of doing any wrongdoing from their investigations, the mud had stuck oh, by oh, that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us what happened. You got all these that were that just pushing the agenda of that. This is it. It's a mass cover up. And that was that was the whole target. Then that became, uh, it's a mass cover up. He's getting away with it. He's it, the town's corrupt. The police is corrupt. The council's corrupt. He's got. Uh, he pays off everything. And that was just like, hang on, are we living in Pakistan? What was that like for your kids? Uh, it was horrendous for my kids. Absolutely horrendous. And that is at, the, at that point, uh, in 2019, we were struggling as it was because my, son, my eldest son started to self farming. Mm -hmm. He dropped out of college because people were calling uh, and he was he was he had one of the ice cream vans and he was constantly getting cold. And, you know, people talking about your dad, you, you know... You, it, it's the worst possible allegation, allegation. as well, isn't it? And, he, and this is now two weeks prior to me getting arrested. I walked in. I'm going to the bathroom, he's, uh, and it's half one in the morning, and his bedroom lights on, and I walked in, and you see his son, all cut. Uh, it's it's yeah. devastating, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And we did it, we all tried to keep strong by not sharing what we're going yeah. through. And you, you know, just to keep that, no, some sort of normality and at home. And you're thinking, it'll be fine, fine. I've yeah. not done anything, anything. Yeah. it'll be okay. But this is just rumours at the time. Mm. Then, two weeks later, I'm getting arrested, 
and then a year later, this post goes up, and you know, it's it, business that was ruined, it totally ruined, and you just think, wow, what do we do here? And then obviously the police get involved, and you've got all all the death threats. Mm. You know, I, like I've got messages like people that were saying we're going to rape your wife uh, in front of your kids, and then we're going to burn your house. Then there's the young man who Ellie met up with in Leeds, who she also accused of rape. He has not been named publicly, but he also suffered consequences of his name being out there as a rapist when these accusations were first made. He fell into a depression, unable to complete his studies in school, unable to work. He also tried to kill himself. He also survived, but to this day, he has constant anxiety. He doesn't trust anybody. Then we have those demonstrations and property destruction and hate crimes that took place after that Facebook post. Many people in the Asian community were attacked, harassed, and had their properties vandalized all because of these false allegations that were completely made up. And even though Ellie was found guilty, you know that these men will have these accusations looming over their heads for the rest of their lives. In cases like this one, there's so many people that will hear the original story that's been reported where they were accused of rape, but then never actually follow up to see what really happened. So people read a headline, oh, this man is a rapist and the leader of a sex ring, and then people read that, get upset but then never actually look further into it or never return to the stories when they see it being reported on again or seeing the story being corrected or seeing that this was all just a lie or people do come back and see it and they just don't believe it. So there are going to be people out there who got half the story and will believe for the rest of their lives that these men are violent rapists. Then last but certainly not least, her lies will have an effect on any and all women who have suffered sexual abuse and rape, the real victims. While false reporting of rape is incredibly rare, cases like this have a major negative impact on the real victims. People will hear her story and use it as a way to be like, see, women make false reports all the time. Who's to say that she isn't lying too? Her lies have hurt every single woman out there who has been raped or sexually assaulted, especially those women who were not believed or did not get to see their attacker being held accountable. Because cases like this one give people the excuse to say, well, some women do lie. And I can't even begin to explain how badly that hurts real victims. But even with this case, I urge you, I implore you to still believe all women. Yes, cases like this happen occasionally, but almost every other woman out there who has made claims like this are real victims and they deserve to be believed because yes, cases like this ruin lives. But women who were raped or sexually assaulted, their lives are also irreversibly damaged. So please, again, even with cases like this, I implore you to just believe all women. But either way, with all of these factors considered, the judge in Ellie's case came to his decision regarding her sentence. Ellie will serve a total of eight and a half years behind bars for her crimes. The harm of this offending extends to an undermining of public confidence in the criminal justice system. We are aware that sex trafficking of young females does occur. There is a risk that genuine victims will, as a result of this defendant's actions, feel deterred from reporting it. People may be less likely to believe their allegations. I'm sure that those charged with investigating such offences will do all in their power to avoid any reluctance to investigate such allegations. Ellen Williams, please stand up. These are the sentences that you will serve. On count one, there will be a sentence of six months imprisonment. On counts three to five, the sentence will be three years imprisonment, concurrent on each count, but consecutive to the sentence on count one, giving a total so far of three and a half years. There will be sentences of five years on counts five, six and seven, concurrent with one another, but consecutive to the sentences already imposed. Finally, there will be a sentence of one year and three months imprisonment on count eight and six months imprisonment on count nine. Those sentences to run concurrently with each other and the other sentences imposed. That gives a total sentence of eight and a half years imprisonment. You will serve half of the total sentence of imprisonment in custody, after which you will be released on licence. The days spent in custody will count towards your sentence.
Now, obviously, the falsely accused men in this case are happy that she's in prison, but they do not think that eight years is long enough given just how much they have suffered because of what she did and the fact that Ellie is still not admitting to lying. She is still trying to say that everything she said was true. She has shown no remorse, and in fact, she has appealed her conviction. Jordan believes that she should be behind bars for life, and the detectives investigating this case have said if she wasn't behind bars, they truly believe that this behavior wouldn't have stopped, and it may have even escalated further. Some investigators believe that she could have killed herself in the midst of trying to make up these false allegations. So, it's really for her own safety that she remains behind bars. I don't believe it. I don't think she has any remorse. I looked back a few times while the judge was speaking, and there was just no remorse shown, so I don't think there's any there. Now I know she's locked away for a bit longer, it's just a bit of a relief, but I wish it was longer a sentence. I do think I'll be able to move on with my life a little bit, but I'm also going to have the thought in my head that it's only two years of my life till she's free again. So I, as bad as it sounds, I do think I'm going to move out of the area and so I'm not in the same areas when she's released. After all of this, there's never really been any explanation for Ellie's behaviors. Family members, including Lucy, Ellie's mother, and her father, have all been outspoken about their support for Ellie. They've all said that they don't know why she would have come up with such elaborate lies. However, her father and the rest of her family have said that they don't actually believe that all of her stories are made up. They truly believe that she was abused at some point in her childhood and that when she tried to tell her story, she wasn't believed. And that may have led her to telling the stories after that. Her mother has also said that she believes that her trafficking stories are true. They do not believe that she would harm herself in the way she did. She had such severe injuries that her family simply didn't think she could have caused them herself. She had a cut finger, her throat cut at one point. They do not believe that she would have done that to herself. They said that yes, they do believe that some of the stories she made up are lies, but they don't think that the injuries were self-inflicted. Her sister, Lucy, also said that there is absolutely no chance that her injuries were self-inflicted. She said that she saw them in person and there's no way that someone could have done that to themselves. She also said that she has seen Ellie being harassed by different men in bars and club settings, so she believes that one of those men could have hurt her. And maybe something happened in her past where, again, she wasn't believed and that caused her to make up all of these lies so that she would be believed. And obviously, she would get attention from all of this and she could see all of these people acting out and demonstrating and all of this attention was going to her because of the claims that she made. Do you think there's any chance, theoretically, that on that occasion she hurt herself? No. In order to create more impact? No. That no. On that occasion, that one time, she couldn't have done it to herself? I don't believe so, no. Very few other people have seen those injuries firsthand. Yeah. You have. Yeah. You were there. Just describe them. I've never seen anything like it. Either way, as of right now, that is all of the information we have on this case. Now, when it comes to all of the stories that Ellie told and why she would lie, I do believe that there may have been some event in her past that made her feel like she wasn't believed for whatever reason. Whether it was abuse, whether it was a mental illness, whether it was sexual assault or something like that, I do think that something happened in her past that made her feel like she needed to act out. I do think that there's also some sort of mental illness there because no mentally healthy person would go to the lengths that Ellie went to. But I do think that all of the stories we talked about here were fabricated. Obviously, there is evidence to prove that she made up these stories and in doing so, she ruined the lives of so, so many people. And to me, the fact that she blamed men that she hardly even knew, some of which she had never even met, is beyond me. It was said that she Google searched some random people in her area and that is how she chose some of the men to blame. I just don't get like 
if you have this grudge against someone, why not choose them? Obviously, that's also wrong. But why are you choosing to blame random men that you've never met and that have nothing to do with you? My big questions are, why did she choose Muhammad for the sex trafficking story? That is such, such a massive lie. Why wouldn't she just say that he raped her? Why did she have to bring in all these other people, all these other victims, make up this huge elaborate story of years and years and years of sex trafficking? That makes no sense. I also want to know, why did she say that Asian men gang raped her? God knows. I personally, this might be a hot take, but I do think that racism played part in that. In some sick way, maybe she thought that blaming minorities would make her stories more believable, or maybe she simply didn't like these populations, which makes things even worse. The fact that she went racist with it, that's just like the cherry on top of everything else that she did. But at the end of the day, there's truly no explanation for why someone would do something as horrific as Ellie did. And honestly, I don't know if we're ever going to find out because I think that Ellie will live the rest of her life claiming that these things really did happen to her. I don't think she's ever going to at least publicly admit that she was lying. But at the end of this case, I do want to hear what you all think. Why do you think she did this? Why do you think she chose to blame the people she did? Do you agree with her family and that some of what she told is actually true? Or do you think it's all lies? Do you think something happened in her past that caused her to come up with all of these lies? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. Also, make sure you head to Nutrafol.com and enter code RS10 at checkout to get $10 off of your first month's subscription. If you have any case suggestions, make sure you fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!